The Exodus details God's deliverance of His people in a very specific place and time. But these pivotal events foreshadow the deliverance that God will bring to His people in every place and every time through Jesus. Just as the slaves in Egypt were delivered through God's faithfulness, we have been, are being, and will be delivered by Christ. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. The central event in the Old Testament is the exodus of God's people from Egypt to the Promised Land. It was the time when God delivered his people from bondage to a place where they could enjoy his favor. It's an important event because it was the beginning of the nation. Uh, Abraham was the father of the nation, but, but when you really point to God establishing his people on earth, we see it happening through the exodus. It was important because it displayed God's power, that no obstacle standing against our God can, can, can keep them from becoming what he has intended for them to be. It's important because it revealed his character. That throughout the people of Israel's history, they would remember the Exodus and remember that God would never forsake them. And it was important because it offered them hope. No matter what they were facing or who was trying to oppress them, they could look back to the moment uh, of the exodus and know that God not only was able to deliver, but he would be faithful to redeem his people. And that's why when we look through the Old Testament, we see the psalmist praising the Lord for bringing the people of Israel through the Red Sea. Or we read in the prophets how that if we, uh, as if the people of God failed to uh, follow God, they would experience the cursings that, that Moses delivered. Uh, we see to the exiles, that even in the midst of your bondage, the God who brought the people free from Egypt can bring you free. Uh, Exodus has been the object of a lot of movies, uh, from Charlton Heston to Disney. We all have images uh, of what uh, this, this moment might have looked like. And so for the next few weeks, I'm not going to spend a ton of time going verse by verse through every detail of the Exodus because I know most of you have some concept of that. But what I am going to do is we're going to talk about how this exodus, which was a historical event, it actually happened, what the Bible says happened, did happen. I, we're going to talk about how this historical event is more than just a moment that happened to one people in one place at one time. It is a metaphor that, that pictures the redemption that God desires for for all of his people at all time in every place. We're going to look at how the New Testament takes those themes of the Exodus and how it uses them to illustrate how God's still redeeming people today. So in a way, I guess it's okay for us to call this a personal Exodus, a personal journey through uh, the, the, the story in the Old Testament, which looks like a mirror to our own story. Uh, we're, we're going to just look at a few snapshots, uh, but, uh, but we're going to be encouraged, I believe, at how these snapshots reveal the character of our God. The story of Exodus actually begins in Genesis. God creates this perfect creation who, who is given every opportunity to live in bliss. But the first man and the first woman fall, and with that fall, they face some really harsh realities. The work gets harder. And not only that, the hard reality of being separated from God sets in. You see judgment coming in Noah and in the Tower of Babel. But our God is a merciful God. Every man deserved to die. But God was completely merciful. And he called a people for himself when he called Abraham. Uh, Father Abraham, the one of faith, would, would be the the the... the founder of a great nation, and even though he was old and his wife was barren and they didn't have kids, he believed God, and God blessed them with, the ch with children. When we come to the book of Exodus, we are introduced to uh, his great-grandchild, Joseph. Uh, Joseph, through sin of his family, 
had ended up being sold into slavery uh, into Egypt. But God showed incredible favor to him. Uh, so much favor that he rose to power and his wisdom and God's favor allowed Egypt to become the world superpower. Uh, in a series of nothing short of God events, his brothers end up coming back to Egypt and begging for bread. Joseph uh, was touched by God and offered forgiveness to his brothers. And he not only offered forgiveness, he allowed his family to come and live in the land of Egypt because there was a great famine in Canaan. So they come and settle in Egypt, and not only do they settle in Egypt, they settle in the best part of Egypt, in the land of Goshen. Uh, but, but there came a time when Joseph dies, and the people who knew Joseph die, and when Joseph was forgotten, the goodwill that he had achieved was forgotten, and the people of Israel were seen as a threat. Their numbers were were just too great. And this is where the book of Exodus picks up. Chapter 1, verse 6, Joseph and all his brothers and all of that generation eventually died. And, and the Israelites were fruitful, they were multiplying, God was blessing them, they're increasing rapidly, but their numbers became so numerous that the land was filled with them. And the new king, who didn't know Joseph, was threatened. Verse 9 tells us that he said to his people, look, the Israelites our, our, our people are numerous, more numerous and powerful than we are. And if we don't get control of this situation, we're in big trouble. And so he decides to deal shrewdly with them so that he can make sure that the Egyptians maintain power. Uh, but instead of expelling Israel or driving them out, he says, man, we have this opportunity to, to make a name for ourselves on the back of the Israelites. And so instead of expelling them, he enslaves them. Uh, and verse 11 tells us that the Egyptians assigned taskmasters over the Israelites to oppress them with forced labor. And they build Pithom and Ramses as supply cities for Pharaoh so he could continue uh, his expansion. Uh, in verse 11, we realize they move from welcome guests to forced labor. In verse 12, it says that even though they were being oppressed, they continued to multiply. And, and so much so that the Israelites not only thought they might be a threat, they began to dread that this was a clear and present danger. Verse 13 says they, they intensified the work on the Israelites and they ruthlessly treated them uh, harshly. And, and they made their lives bitter with difficult labor in brick and mortar and all kinds of field works. And they ruthlessly imposed all this work on them. They enslaved them. I don't know if there's anything uglier or more devaluing to humanity than slavery. Uh, to think that one human being, one flawed human being, would be so arrogant that they believe that they could control and devalue another human being is reprehensible. Uh, in every culture, in every part of the world, in every form, slavery is vile. Period. No excuses for that. Uh, we have to acknowledge in our history, we have vile moments. And even in the history of the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, we didn't appropriately respond to this issue of slavery. It was there, it was real, and it was ugly. Christians need to be clear about this. Um, we see how in Exodus, bondage not only is ugly, but it can be devastating. You're going to see how ugly bondage can be through the story of Exodus. Verse 15, the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, uh, and he gives a couple of examples of these midwives. He says to them, when you help the Hebrew women give birth, observe them as they deliver. If they have a son, kill that son. If they have a daughter, let the daughter live. We'll let them marry e Egyptians. They'll become loyal to us. This is our plan. Kill the son. Well, first of all, these midwives didn't listen. Uh, they, they knew what a lot of Americans don't know, that life of children is valuable, whether it's in the womb or, or once it's born, a life of every child is valuable. Uh, and they, they resisted, and Pharaoh was angry. Uh, verse 22, Pharaoh commands then his people and says, look, the midwives aren't taking care of it. You throw every son born uh, to the Hebrews into the Nile. 
uh, but let every daughter live. I mean, imagine this scene. Children being ripped from their parents, thrown in the river Nile. I mean, I, as I think about this, I would think they would have just killed the children. They would have killed this daddy too. Because I would have died trying to protect my children. But what we see, there's something that happens in oppression. There's something that happens in slavery. In, 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 in this bondage, you, you, you see that people become so dominated they don't even know how to fight back. And that's what happens here in, in the book of Exodus. It seems like in every chapter we see these harsh realities of bondage. Their treatment is harsher and harsher and they were forced to increase their production to impossible levels. They were beaten and they were even killed. And not only that, their hope diminished. So much so that when God raises up a leader, Moses, to lead them out of bondage, Moses is talking to God at the burning bush and he pushes back and says, Pharaoh will never let him go. And God says, I got that. I'll take care of Pharaoh. But then Moses pushes back and says, the people won't even believe me, God. They're not going to listen to me because their hope's gone. For 430 years, they've been in bondage and, and they won't believe me and won't obey me. They'll say the Lord didn't appear to you. The reality is, is Moses understood that for 11 generations, this is all they've known. They were so trapped that their hope was gone. You ever had a time in your life where hope felt like it was completely gone? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be honest. Most of my life, I've kind of seen glimmers out there. Just kind of my day. I, it's going to get better. There's a new day, new opportunity. Most of my life, I've seen that. Uh, but I've met a few people who've lost it. A uh, man who owned a business for about 45 years and fell apart at my last church. And the look in his eyes was just all hope is gone. I've seen this look a few other times in the eyes of parents who've lost children. Uh, you can just see it. Uh, I saw it when I was in Jerusalem at the Holocaust Museum. And the pictures, as you walk through the Holocaust Museum and you see the, the eyes of the people who were in bondage and know that their hope was gone, you just see the hopelessness. Hopelessness is a rough thing. It, it, it's a difficult thing. And it set in on the people in slavery. Not only did they have a dominating master and didn't have much hope, they had a master who wasn't going to let go easily. You know the story. I mean, God sends plague after plague, flies and frogs and locusts and hell. But, but Pharaoh and the Egyptians continued to resist. You know, I've often thought if he'd have sent spiders and snakes or maybe played Justin Bieber music through the land, that would have done it, you know? <laughs> maybe, you know. Seriously, though, the oppressors never let go easily. We, they don't. And then on top of that, one of the ugly things about bondage is people can't change their situation. They're just helpless to change. And one of the clear messages of Exodus is this. If God had not acted, they would have stayed in bondage. If God had not moved, they would have remained in slavery. And this theme runs throughout the Bible. And it's not only true for them, but it's true for every person in every place. Men in bondage need a deliverer. And that brings us to John chapter 8. If you have your Bibles there, turn to John chapter 8 with me this morning. Jesus picks up on this theme that men need a deliverer. And that men are in bondage. In verse 30 of John chapter 8, as he was saying these things, many believed in him. If you read the book of John, John paints this picture of there's many of times in Jesus' ministry where he would do a miracle or he would heal someone or he would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the religious leaders and lots of people would believe. They would be like, oh, we, we see it, we believe. But, and, and, and Jesus is portrayed in John as teaching them that if you really believe in me, you hang with me not just when I feed people and not just when I heal people and not just when I tri trip up the religious people. If you really believe with me, you stay, believe in me, you stay all the time. And that's where he picks up in John 8, 31. Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, if you continue in my word, you're my disciple. Not just if you enjoy the show, 
It's not just, man, that speaker was awesome. It's not just, man, that music, it just touched my heart. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, you're my disciples. Sometimes Jesus' word was hard. Sometimes Jesus' word was brutally hard. John chapter 5, just a, or 6, excuse me, just a couple of chapters earlier, Jesus feeds the 5,000, but then he tells them, unless you're going to die the death I die, and you're going to live the life I live, which is pouring myself out for others, you can't be my disciples. And in John 6, verse 60, it said, when many of his disciples heard this, they said, this teaching is hard. Who can accept it? And does anybody know what it says right after that in John 6? From this point on, many of his disciples followed him no more. I believe that's 66. That's where people get to. We're fine following you, Jesus, as long as it's fun. We're fine following you, Jesus, as long as it's easy. But Jesus said, if you follow me, you follow me. Wherever, whenever, through whatever. And notice, he, he, when they say this teaching is hard, who can accept it? They were paying attention because Jesus' teaching is hard. I talked about that last week. It's not this cream puff, give your dollar and I'll give you ten. And it's not this, hey, you know, sow your seed and God's going to give you the new business and God's going to give you the jet airplane. That's hogwash from hell. Jesus is teaching with you. If you want to follow me, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Jesus' teaching was, if you want to, to save your life, you've got to give your life away. Jesus' is teaching uh, was was not one of, of, of prosperity and wealth. It was of humility and death to self. He taught sacrifice. And he says, but you'll know the truth. If you follow me, you listen to my words, you stand my words, you'll know the truth. And here's what will happen. That truth will set you free. Completely free. And notice what they say. This is, this is rich. Verse 33. We're descendants of Abraham. We've never been enslaved to anyone. And I can almost hear Jesus saying, oh yeah, you remember the Exodus? You know, and, oh, and they might have said, well, yeah, but we're talking about us, not those children of Abraham. And he probably would have said, oh yeah, you remember the Romans? Have you looked around? <laughs> you're, you, you're in bondage. And, 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 and they, but they push back and say, how can you say we'll become free? And Jesus never misses a teaching moment. Of course, he set this teaching moment up. And listen to what he says in verse 34. Truly, I tell you, everybody who commits a, commits a sin is a slave to sin. When you sin, you're a slave to sin. And this is a truth that's difficult. Everybody who sins is in bondage. And we talked about this a few weeks ago, but a central debate in our society is this, is man basically good or is man sinful? I mean, that, that central debate in our society, oh, it's not cloaked in religious terms, but if you will pay attention, you will find solutions that are not God-centered. You'll find solutions that are not his word-centered. You'll find solutions that are completely man-centered. If we could educate you guys enough, man, you can do whatever you want. If we give you the right opportunity, or if we let you be born on the right side of the tracks, or if we give you, man, you can make it on your own. That's what the world wants you to believe. And here's what Jesus says. It's not true. Everybody who commits a sin can't make it on their own. They get in bondage to that sin. They get completely entangled in it. And there's nothing they can do to break free on their own. It's as if they're in slavery. If man is good, you help him, you focus on, on him, you prop him up and he'll overcome. But if man is sinful, no matter what you do, no matter how you educate, no matter how you elevate, no matter how you encourage, no matter what opportunities you give, he can't overcome. And that's what the Bible teaches. It teaches that, that we are all born with a sinful nature that we can't overcome. David said, I was guilty when I was born. It's in our DNA. Nobody had to teach me to be selfish with my toys. Nobody had to teach me to fuss and cry when it wasn't all about me. Nobody had to teach me how to, to think about myself. Rather, it was innate. It's in my DNA. Since Adam sinned in the garden, that has been in every man and woman and boys and girls' DNA. It, 
It's in us. It's in all of us. That's why the Bible says in Romans 5, 12, sin entered into the world through one man. And because of this, we're in bondage and death came through sin. And in this way, death spread to all people because we all, all willingly participated. We had the desire and then we did the deed. We had the urge and then we followed through. It's not like we can look back and blame Adam or blame our mom and dad or our grandparents or our forefathers and say, look what they did. It's in us all. And if if, if, if you are here and old enough to, to, to say your name, I can assure you that there has come a point in your life where you have willfully thought, I know this is wrong and I'm going to do it anyway. Jesus said everyone who commits a sin is a slave to sin and the Bible says we're all sinners. And when we sin, we get entangled in it. This sin which seems so right it's so good, and it's going to make us happy if I just had this relationship, or if I did this action, or if I achieved this success, or if I, whatever, this action that seems so right leads to death. There's a way, the Bible says, it seems right to a person, but its end is death. You know, our problem is we don't see sin as a pathway that leads to death. We see sin as an event that we can stick our toes in and get out anytime we want. But there's never been a more addictive drug known to humanity than sin. It wraps its clutches around us and it will require you to up your usage to get that same high. And it will continue to pull you in. And the problem with this addictive drug of sin is it leads to this sinful pattern. We get on this merry-go-round where we sin and we sin and we sin and we want off because we hate the death that it leaves us with, but we can't get off and we continue this cycle of sin. Overeating, sexual addiction, belittling others to make others look bad and us look better. Lying to get out of trouble, substances to ease our mind, disrespecting authorities. It is in us all. Paul said it this way, we were all slaves to sin. We obeyed from the heart because it was in our DNA. The pattern of teaching that we were handed over to. Bear Bryant once said, you quit the first time, it's hard. The second time, it gets easier. The third time, you don't even have to think about it. Sin works like that in reverse. It lets you dabble your toe in it, but then it entangles you. And before long, you're completely trapped. James talks about this pattern. Each person is tempted when he's drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. And then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. And that's what the Bible says happens to those who become slaves to sin. It leads them to death. I don't have this passage up, but in Ephesians 2 it says, you are dead in your sins and your trespasses. And then it goes on to use metaphors like we're walking and living, but you're living as dead men. You have nothing you can do to change your situation. Every person here has sinned and every person has been trapped. And all of those things that were true about the people of Israel in bondage are true of people trapped in sin. You have an enemy that wants to dominate you. You have an enemy that doesn't want you to be free and he will fight to keep you in bondage. And he has a goal for your life that is death. Isn't this what Jesus said? John 10.10 10? The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The thief wants to crush you and Jesus says every person who commits a sin is heading down that path, but that's not what God wants for your life. That is absolutely not what God wants. He, Jesus came. He left heaven and came to earth. He became flesh and dwelt among us so that we could be delivered from the bondage of our sin and so that we could have life and have it abundantly. God's not waiting to kick you while you're down. He's waiting for you to see that your way has only brought you death. You know, one of my favorite parts of the Exodus story that we don't highlight much 
is the motivation for the exodus. There's 25 references that I found this week. I think it's 25, 26 references. Uh, I'm going to highlight five of them. Chapter 2. After a long time, the king of Egypt died and the Israelites groaned because of their difficult labor. They cried out to God and their cry for help because of their difficult labor, it ascends to God. In verse 24, it says, God heard their groaning. God knew. He remembered his covenant. He saw the Israelites and he knew. Chapter 3, verse 7. The Lord says to Moses, I've observed the misery of my people. I've heard them cry. I know about their sufferings. And I have come down to rescue. There's the motivation. The reason God wants to rescue us from our sin is because he loves us. He, doesn't, he didn't create us to grind us into powder. He didn't create us so that we could just live and then die and be no more. He didn't create us so that we could be oppressed by the enemy. He created us to love us and have relationship with us. And so he came down to rescue us. Maybe today your outside looks fine. But maybe today your heart's in bondage. Maybe today you feel trapped. Maybe today you feel overcome. Maybe even today you feel no hope. I want you to understand that God knows your plight and he loves you. He loves you so much that he sent his only son so that you could be set free from sin. This is why Jesus came, to set you free. Through his work on the cross, Jesus paid a debt for you that you could not pay. And through his death and resurrection, he broke the chains that, uh, of sin that held us, and he came to set you free. And when Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, he was talking about uh, himself. He wasn't talking about a philosophy, and he definitely wasn't talking about a religious exercise where you show up in church. He was talking about having a personal relationship with himself. Later in the book of John, John makes this clear when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. This is how you find life, through me. Jesus is saying you can't set yourself free from bondage. You'll never be able to liberate yourself by your own effort. You'll only be liberated by God's work. Freedom comes from putting your trust in Christ, following him instead of following yourself, and receiving what he's done. And if he sets you free, listen to what Jesus says. If the Son sets you free, you're free. You are 100% free. You are free indeed free. What, what does really free mean? Well, let me give you a couple of thoughts. One, it means you're free from condemnation. The picture here is of a guilty person who deserves to die, but, but through uh, a merciful act of a judge, that guilt is overturned and they've been set free. And he said, you are free from that condemnation. Our slavery is from sin and sin brings with it the promise of death. And we, when we start a relationship with Christ, we are set free from the death sentence and there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. In verse 2, because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. That's good news, folks. Christ Jesus can set you free. But really, free is more than just free from your past. It's also freedom from your future. Because some of you, you know the pattern of sin and you know it well. You've lived in it over and over and over. And you have, 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 have won it off of the merry-go-round, but you've never found a way off and your best efforts have done nothing except leaving you broken. Or have left you broken. But we're free to live differently in Christ. We're no longer a slave to sin. We're no longer in chains to our inner desires of our sinful nature. We're no longer driven by an enemy that's bent on our harm. We have a new nature. We can love others. We have a new nature. We can forgive other people. We have, we, we've been changed. We can resist temptation. We can live lives that please God. So if you're here this morning and you feel trapped in sin, or if you're watching online and you feel trapped in sin, I want you to understand Jesus came 
to break the hold that sin has on you. Hallelujah. He has set you free. Satan's grip, sin's grip has lost its hold on you. If you put your trust in Christ, you do not have to live in that condemnation. He can set you free. He, he has proclaimed the good news to you. He has set you free. You are free if you put your trust in Christ. If you put your trust in Christ, Satan's grip is gone. But I hear people, some of us who've put our trust in Christ, who've gone through the baptismal waters to show the world that we believe, who confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God is raising from the dead. I've seen some, uh, I, 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 I've witnessed some people who say, Pastor, sometimes I still feel like I'm in bondage. I want you to understand what free indeed means. It means free forever. You are free forever from sin. He has set you free forever. But hear this next statement closely. You choose whether or not you're going to live in your freedom. If you're in Christ, you're free. But you're going to choose whether or not you live in freedom. We're going to see in the story of Exodus that God sets his people free and sometimes they revert to a, a bondage mindset. A Christian cannot be returned to bondage. But sometimes we forget we're free. We're going to deal in the coming weeks uh, with some of these realities. But don't forget if you put your faith in Christ, you're free. And don't forget that your past is forgiven. And don't forget you'll never be a slave to sin again. Did you know elephants can grow up to like five tons? That seems like right on point, right? This is the statement you were waiting for. You know, elephants can grow up to five tons. I mean, and, and they're pretty good at going where they want to. They can walk over trees, establish trees, and just crush them. Brush, parts, even houses can be trampled by, by elephants. And so needless to say, it's kind of a difficult thing to, to, to take captive a wild elephant. Zoos and those with appropriate staff might be able to take an, an elephant captive and, and keep him uh, in chains. But in Africa, those elephants that are even born into captivity could be a handful because <laughs> captivity is a pretty loose word. There are no pins, no fences. You know, uh, 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 no, no, no cages. So how in the world do they keep elephants captive? I mean, these, these beings have the power to be free. It's really easy. When a baby elephant is born, they'll take a super large chain. They will shackle that chain to one of the legs of the elephant, and they'll tie it to an enormously large tree. And since the baby elephant's small, he doesn't have the power. He tries, relentlessly tries to get away, but after a while, it just hurts. And so he quits trying. As the baby elephant grows, he maybe continues to try every now and then, but over time, his will is broken. So much so that when the baby elephant's fully grown, they can take that elephant and tie him to a rope that we couldn't, you know, uh, uh, pull a, uh, a wagon with and they'll put that little rope to a little sapling tree and that elephant will stay there. As I thought about that imagery, I thought, boy, that's a whole lot like Christians. The cross has broken the shackles. The cross has delivered us from the, 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 the captivity that the enemy held us in. And we still have that sinful nature, so I guess in a way it still feels like we kind of have that rope around our leg. But those of us who've knelt at the cross, those of us who've given our life to Christ, we've been set free. We, we are free, and the Bible says, for those of y'all who put your trust in Christ, who the Son sets free, you're really free. For the next few weeks, we're going to talk about some of 
the story of Exodus, and many of these moments have to deal with us slipping back into a bondage mindset. I hope you'll make plans to be here the next few weeks as we do. But today, what I really hope you understand is that all men were in bondage. Every one of us were in bondage to sin. All of us. And I hope you understand that there's not a person that's going to find freedom outside of Christ. I don't care what our society says. They all say the same thing. Humanity needs to do something. Humanity has failed forever. That's why God had to come down and do something to deliver us from our bondage. And the only way you can find freedom is to move your trust from trusting in what you can do and and your own wisdom to putting your trust in what Christ did on the cross and the wisdom of God that saw fit to pay for our sin through the blood of his son. And then I'd remind you, and we'll be focusing on this in the next few weeks, if you've trusted in Christ to set you free, You can live in your freedom. That is the choice that I pray that you'll make. Let's pray together. Father God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would use these words to glorify yourself today. God, I thank you that, Father, you sent Jesus. Jesus, I thank you that you came. Holy Spirit, I'm so thankful that you spoke to my heart and testified of the truthfulness of his death and resurrection. God, I thank you, Lord, that through your Spirit's leading, I put my faith in you. I thank you, Lord, that through your Spirit's leading, you have set me free. God, I pray if there's anybody here today who has not confessed you as Lord and believes in their heart that Jesus has been raised from the dead, I pray today that your Holy Spirit would work in a powerful way in their heart this morning. I pray that they would be overwhelmed by the truth of the gospel. And God, God, I pray today that they would respond in faith. For those of us who are believers, Lord, may we live in in the freedom that was purchased for us. May we experience the life and abundant life that Jesus has called us to. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, we have a time that we call invitation or a time of decision. Uh, Everybody stands up and y'all can stand. Uh, Go ahead and stand, it's fine. And we're going to sing. And the song's a worship song that we're going to be reminded of what we just heard. Uh, But it's also a time where you can come and express faith in Christ. Maybe you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Christ Jesus. Some people were 13 like I was, 12, 13, when I gave my life to Christ. Some people were like Mary who gave her life to Christ when she was in her 20s. Some people were like my dad who gave his life to Christ when he was in his 40s. Uh, Some people have given their life to Christ in their autumn years. But if God speaks to you today, I'd love for you to come and give your life to Christ. Here's how you'll do that. When we start to sing, everybody's going to be singing. Uh, Some people will be praying in their heart. But if you know you've never given your life to Christ, what I'd like for you to do is come to the front. And there's a couple people down here. Come talk to me if you don't know what to do. I'll put my mask on. You don't have to be afraid of me. But you come and you tell me, I want to give my life to Christ. I know I need to give my life to Christ. And I'll I'll let you talk to somebody about what that means. Maybe you're here today and you watch Mary get baptized. And you're thinking, I know I've never been baptized since I was a believer. Baptism is is, is a symbol of saying, I am a believer. It's not a religious exercise that we do that, that you just have to do to check a box. It is a symbol telling everybody, this is my faith. I'm a believer in Christ. If you've not been baptized since you became a believer in Jesus Christ, I would encourage you to come today and, and say, I want to follow the Lord in baptism. Or perhaps today you want to join our church. Uh, there's a process to that. You'll come and talk to someone today uh, and then become a member next week if you're a believer and have been baptized, regardless of what church you come from. Uh, That would happen today. But if God speaks to you and you need to come, you can come. Maybe there's a sin in your life that you're living like the elephant that's tied to a sapling and you've been set free from that. Maybe you just need to come today and just pray at the altar. You're welcome to come. But if God speaks to you, 
while we sing, won't you come right now? <laughs>